This year is the 75th anniversary of 1945, the last year of World War II. And in many ways, what our country is experiencing here in the spring of 2020 is somewhat reminiscent or analogous to what this country experienced uh, in the weeks after Pearl Harbor. World War II was like a, a time out of time. It was, a, it, was a, it was a time when the rules of ordinary life were suspended and replaced by new patterns and ways of living for the duration, as the phrase went. Uh, it was an entirely new kind of situation. And I would argue that the changes that the country went through, especially on the home front during World War II, were necessary to win the war. In fact, it was the home front, I would say, that tipped the balance, that, uh, that uh, made the difference um, between victory and defeat for the Allies in World War II. And the biggest change, of course, at first, was uh, the millions of uh, young American men and women uh, going into the armed forces. Uh, you could see that in 1939, there were you know, 334,000 Americans in the military. In 1940, we're still at under half million. 1941, the year of Pearl Harbor, we still have under two million men and women in, in the military. It, isn't really, it doesn't really start to ramp up that much until 1942, 1943, when the numbers start to go up. By 1944, we have over 11 million in the military. And by 1945, we have over 12 million people serving in the armed forces. By the end of the war, over 16 million men and women would have served in the armed forces. And uh, uh, well over half, about 60%, were draftees. There, were, there was no precedent for a military being this big in our country. I mean, the Civil War, which was an enormous war, was fought between two million in the north and one million in the south. Um, uh, the, uh, the World War I was at a four million fought in, four, four million Americans served in uniform in that war. Uh, and the only way we could get the numbers up into the tens of millions was through the draft, conscription. Now, there, there, the conscription or the draft had always been controversial. President James Monroe tried to raise a draft for the War of 1812, and he was roundly criticized it and had to abandon it. Daniel Webster gave a speed up, speech on the floor saying that, you know, that, that uh, conscription would be just a violation of American liberties. It would be a, an un-American assault on the American way of life. Uh, there was a draft in, 19, in 1863 for the Civil War. I think if Abraham Lincoln uh, could have taken it back, he would have, because it was really pretty much a disaster. And it was not similar to the drafts that we were familiar with in the 20th century. That The draft in 1863 was really, was really coordinated by the states. The states were obligated to send a certain number of volunteers per state. There was a quota for every state. And if the state didn't fill the quota, the state would have to go out to households and fill the quota from a, a draft. The households would actually have to determine who from that house would be serving in the military. There were ways to get out of it. You could um, find somebody, pay somebody to replace you. Uh, you could pay a $300 commutation fee to the federal government to get out of it. Uh, it was enormously controversial. Uh, it, there were, people didn't you know, burn their draft cards, they burned down the draft office, you know, and lynched the draft officers. I mean, there were, there were draft riots in Philadelphia and Boston and New York City. Uh, it was really a catastrophe. And in the end, uh, only 2% of the Union Army uh, served as draftees. Another 6% were people who were serving the place of somebody else. The draft that, that fueled World War II was based on the model that was established in World War I, in April 18, 1917, when uh, Congress declared war on, uh, on Germany in World War I, the U.S. had an army of 120,000, and the projection was we would need two million to fight that war. Uh, Woodrow Wilson put out a vigorous call for volunteers. You'll know that great, uh, you know, we need you, America needs you for the military that James Montgomery Ward uh, famous poster. That was part of this recruitment effort to build the numbers into the military. 
that recruitment effort was a huge failure. 73,000, I think, joined from that effort. And so we had to fall back on a draft. It was called the Selective Service. And uh, in the end, it, it quickly filled the ranks and we got the two million uh, that we needed to, to fight that war. And that was the model that was used for the Selective Training and Service Act of 1940. And this was the first peacetime draft. This was a draft to, as the country was prepared, very controversial, as the country was preparing to fight World War II, seeing war on the horizon, seeing the U.S. being drawn into this war that was already taking place in the Pacific and also in Europe. Uh, the draft was a way to kind of get the country prepared. And it was a pretty mild draft in the sense that, um, you know, people from the ages of, I think it was 21 to 45 were eligible. If you were, if you were married, you, you, you weren't, you were exempt, at least at first. As you can imagine, there was, there was a great boom in the marriage rate in 1940 because of that. And your enlistment was only one year. Uh, the bulk of the draftees came in in October 1940. And the song that would become a popular hit was Goodbye Dear, I'll Be Back in a Year. Goodbye dear, I'll be back in a year Cause I'm in the army now They took my number out of a hat And there's nothing a guy can do about that but when I get back, uh, 50 percent, one million were drafted in October of 1941. One million. So this is an enormous change. And 50 uh, percent, by the way, of those who were drafted were rejected because they were malnourished or they were illiterate. And that was a product of, you know, 11 years of, of the Great Depression. Um, by August 1941, the Army Chief of Staff, George Marshall, sees that he's trained, you know, a million men and they're going to leave the army in, in October. And so he begins to worry. He sees war coming in 1941, and Congress passes an extension, goodbye, a six-month extension. I'll it's no longer goodbye, dear, we'll be back in the year. It's goodbye, dear, we'll be back in the year and a half. And uh, boy, was that unpopular. It, the, those who had been drafted began scrawling on their barracks, and we've had a couple of vets talk about this. Ohio, over the hill in October, meaning they're going to desert or leave when they when their promised enlistment was up in October. That didn't happen, uh, and it especially didn't happen after December 7, 1941, with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Congress immediately amended the Selective Training and Service Act to be that, uh, you know, the draft you'd be, you'd, you'd be serving for the duration of the war plus six months. That was the idea, the duration of the war plus six months. And this was a sprawling draft. By the end of the war, uh, people were registered between the ages of 18 and, and 64. Uh, about 50 million people were registered for the draft. Uh, another, um, another, you know, 10 million were drafted into the service. 75% of all draftees served overseas. And so by the end of the war, you know, you have this standing military that's over 12 million men and women strong, which is just remarkable and absolutely unprecedented in our history. We also had 12 million volunteers serving in the Office of Civil Defense here at home. The Office of Civil Defense was intended to kind of protect the homeland, protect the mainland of, of the U.S. from attack. Now, the War Department had done a study in 1941 that had shown that the chance of any attack on the American mainland was nil, just about. I mean, neither Japan nor Germany had the capability, the heavy bombers who could do that kind of a, a long distance. They, you know, they had, Germany had some plans for an America bomber, but it was never pursued. They, they just didn't have the capability to bomb the U.S. mainland. But there was enormous fear in this country that we would be bombed after Pearl Harbor, enormous fear, especially along the coasts. And so the federal government had to figure out how do we address the fear without wasting valuable military resources kind of protecting all these cities in the interior of the country. And what they came upon was to create an office of civil defense. You could, you know, the old phrase, uh, follow the money. If you follow the money here, you could see how important the office of civil defense really was. Uh, the office of civil, civil defense had a budget that had enough to pay 12 people. There were 12 paid staff members in the Office of Civil Defense. All the rest, the other 12 million, 
were volunteers. I think for a while it was headed by Eleanor Roosevelt, and the volunteers were enlisted to kind of get training, to be plane spotters, to you know look for bombers that might appear overhead, and especially as air raid wardens. That was the biggest job. At least half of all civil defense volunteers were air raid wardens. And air raid wardens, their main job came during blackout drills. Blackout drills were a regular feature of life on the home front during World War II. And, uh, um, uh, and this is how they work. The newspapers would advertise that there would be a, a blackout on uh, June 8th at 10 p.m. And when the blackout occurred, uh, you were to get inside as quickly as you can. If you were driving your car, you had to pull off the side of the road, turn off the lights, and go into the nearest building. Uh, if you were at home, you sh you closed your drapes, and there were special blackout drapes and blackout blinds, turned off all the lights outside your home, inside your home, street lights would go off. The idea is that you want to blacken the entire city, turn off all the lights in the city, so that bombers won't be able to see you down, won't be able to see the city, the places where to bomb. Air raid wardens, their job, was to patrol the streets. There were millions of these people. My grandfather was one in Wilkinsburg, PA. They got special hats, they got a armband, they got a, a flashlight, and they usually had a, you know, a pen and a pad, or a pencil and a pad, and they would patrol their neighborhood. There was supposed to be one air raid warden for every 100 or 150 Americans. Uh, my town that I live in, Mount Lebanon, PA, a suburb of, inner ring suburb of Pittsburgh, uh, we had 800 air raid wardens in a town of 20,000 people, 25,000 people. I mean, ton, you know, the air raid wardens were everywhere. And they would patrol during these blackout drills, and they would look and write down if they saw any light kind of peeking in through a window, they would write that down, and they would warn you. And if you did it again, you, you could be fined. And, and it was, you know, p people took these very, took this very seriously, although the um, story that you often saw was that young men really tried to uh, position themselves to find a way to be out on the sidewalks and dive in in a closely confined place with a pretty young woman. I mean, that was all, you know, the lights out, that was kind of the joke. Um, there were a lot of jokes about these blackout drills. They were a regular feature of life. And then the next day, the newspaper would run a story. They would take a photograph, usually, of what the city looked like. They would have the areas of light circled. There was kind of shaming, you know, people who were who didn't douse the lights during the blackout drill, who defied the blackout drill. And there were people who defied it. You know, we were a remarkably unified country during World War II, but there were plenty of people who, who thought that it was a violation of civil liberties. That in, in the newspaper, there's an article in an Omaha newspaper about a Mrs. John Ellis who says, I um, tell the federal government I won't pay my fine for... Uh, not dousing my lights during a blackout drill. They're my lights. I'll turn them off or on if I want to. Um, and that wasn't typical, but it did happen. She was living in a blackout area of Omaha, Nebraska. She, Mrs. John Ellis believed that there, they weren't threatened in Omaha. And you know what? She was right. Uh, Omaha really did not, in my city of Pittsburgh, uh, although we were an industrial hub, there really wasn't a threat of being bombed by the enemy. However... On the Atlantic coast, there was a threat. There really should have been a blackout every night on the Atlantic coast. And in the next episode, I'll tell you why.